ask you to stand together with us as we sing our call to worship this morning. We're going to sing the chorus of He Touched Me, and then we're going to sing the first verse. I think most all of us know this song. Think back to when Christ touched you. He touched me. into the Christmas season, so we're going to start singing some Christmas songs. Hymn number 81, O Come All You Faithful, hymn number 81. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Brother Oscar is going to come and lead us in prayer. I hope you've had a wonderful week, and it's such a joy this morning to welcome you to the house of the Lord. Brother Oscar, come and lead us in prayer. 
I just found out that Debbie Trotter's mom passed away, so we need to be much in prayer for Debbie and the family. Uh, shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this season of the year when our thoughts go back to Bethlehem, when you came into this world to save sinners from a sin and save sinners and provide salvation for everybody. And you're not willing that any perish, but that all should come to repentance. We want to pray for believers all over the world today, especially those who live in countries where serving you means persecution. And we know there are many believers that are in prison today in China, North Korea, and other countries just because of serving you. And we pray for them in a special way. We pray for our country. We pray for a mighty heaven-sent Holy Spirit revival to sweep our land and turn us back to you. We pray for Eastside Baptist Church. We especially thank you for Preacher Wayne and his wife, Anita. We thank you for the way he boldly proclaims your word. And we just pray that we'll not just be hearers of the word, but we'll be doers of the word. Forgive us now where we fail you, and in Christ's holy name we pray, amen. I ask you to stand with us again as we sing hymn number 82, Go Tell It on the Mountain, for our offertory hymn. May we stand as we sing. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the beautiful songs that we're able to sing this time of year, that we just remember that every time of the year we can, we can go back to the times when we can remember our great salvation when you came into this world. Father, we just thank you for the lesson that we've already studied in the book of Genesis. Father, we just ask that you be with our Pastor, this morning as he brings us the, the word, Father, just uh, bless his studies. Father, as we come to this time in service, we just ask you to bless the gift and the giver. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
this morning to open your Bible. Isaiah chapter 9, and while you're making your way to that passage, um, it was um, about three years ago, not quite three years ago, I retired from the pastorate, and um, that spring after I retired, I knew I needed a project to stay busy, or I'd go start crazy, and I sat on my back porch, and I penned a, I penned a book, and it was published in October, and the title of that book is The Life of Jesus. And I started in the Old Testament, and I dealt with the promise. And then I came to chapter 2, the child was born. In chapter number 3, he went to the temple at age 12, and on and on throughout the book, I walked through the life of Jesus chronologically. Um, I was studying this week and deciding what to preach, and I felt led of the Lord to go back to that uh, passage that the promise was given, and uh, I, I didn't write the whole first chapter over, but I tried to condense it into a message, and I had not done that, and so I hope that you'll be blessed this morning as I preach to you on this subject, The Promise. That's the title of the first chapter in that book that I wrote, The Life of Jesus, and so I hope you'll be blessed this morning as we try to turn our attention and our focus toward Christmas, uh, because certainly we know that uh, that promise was fulfilled and Christ our Lord. And I'm excited about this Christmas season. I hope you are. And I invite you to stand with me as we read um, this text, Isaiah 9 and uh, verse number 6. <clears throat> and we're going to preach to you on this thought, the promise. The Bible says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Today as we study this great promise, I want to walk you through several Old Testament texts that lead us to the Christ child. And so today we want to think together surrounding the idea of the promise that was given to us by none other than God. Himself. Thank you. May be seated, and uh, may the Lord ask, ask, bless the reading of His Word. When I think of how He came so far from glory, came and dwelt among the lowly, such as I, to suffer shame and such disgrace. On Mount Calvary take my place. It's then I ask myself this question, Who am I? Who to 
to fight my battles till they're won. Oh, who am I? Isaiah chapter number 9 and verse number 6. And today I want to preach to you on the thought, His promise. I'm grateful for the promises of God, aren't you? We could be here all day if we tried to walk through the Bible and list the promises the Lord has made to us. There are many, many wonderful promises in the Word of God. For example, in the Proverbs chapter number 3, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. I'm grateful that God directs the paths of men, aren't you? And then I think about the promise over there in uh, the Bible that says in the New Testament, says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Man, that's a good one, isn't it? God said, I'm not going to walk out on you. I don't care who does, I won't. I'm not going to leave you. It doesn't matter who, who does, I won't. The Bible says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And certainly, that's one of those promises that we could put in our promise bank. How about this one? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He didn't say, I might save you. I'll think about it. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm glad I'm in that whosoever group, aren't you? Because I can remember the day that I bowed my head and my heart toward God and asked Him to be merciful to me, a sinner, and come into my heart and save my soul. Folks, I'm telling you, that's a, that's a promise bank. Promise. But this morning... I want to take you to one of the great promises in the Bible. His promises are unlimited. His power is to all generations. The Bible says there in Isaiah 9 and verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Folks, listen. There was a time that God, that this world needed a Savior. And the Bible says that God promised to send that Messiah to us. And so I'm grateful for the many wonderful promises of God. Uh, it was told of Abraham Lincoln, the 16th President of the United States, that one day... Uh, he was riding in a carriage with a, one of his colonels, and down the road they went, and the colonel pulled out a flask of whiskey, 
and took a drink and offered it to the president and said, Mr. President, would you like to have a, a drink of whiskey? To which President Lincoln said, no, thank you, Colonel. And then further down the road, the colonel pulled out a cigar and offered the president a cigar, and he said, Mr. President, would you like to have a cigar? No, thank you, uh, colonel. And then uh, the president realized the colonel was a little bit anxious, and he said to him, he said, let me tell you a story, colonel. He said, when my mama was in the bed sick, I was nine year old, and she called me to her bedside, and she said, Abe, the doctors tell me I'm not going to get any better, and I want you to promise me something. He said to his mom, well, mom, what do you want me to promise you? And uh, Abraham Lincoln's mama said, I want you to promise me that you'll never drink whiskey and you'll never take tobacco into your body. That was a wise mom. And there is a nine-year-old child standing beside his dying mom's bed. He said, I promise you, I'll never drink whiskey and I'll never use tobacco. And then the president looked at that colonel. He said, now, colonel, would you want me to break that promise? To which he said, no, sir, Mr. President, I would not have you break that promise for anything in the world. That was a great promise that the president, as a nine-year-old, made to his mama. He kept that promise. But here's the thing. Folks, I want to tell you, there's a God in heaven, and he's made promises to his children, and he's far greater than the president. And his promises are far more secure than any promise that can be made on this earth. And the Bible tells us that there was going to be a Messiah that was going to come. Now, now in our text today, God makes a promise. God had promised one day to send a deliverer or as he is referred to as the Messiah. The term Messiah is a Hebrew term given to the expected deliverer of the Jews, which was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, let me say that to again, again. The term Messiah was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, the term Christ comes from a Greek word, which means the anointed one, and is the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word Messiah. So what I'm saying to us this morning from the Word of God is that the God of heaven promised that He would send a deliverer, Messiah, to His people that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, the world doesn't like that message, but it doesn't change the truth of it one iota. I'm reminded in Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 25 that Daniel uses the word Messiah to promise the one day deliverer would come. Micah chapter number 5 and verse number 5 promised that the deliverer would be born in Bethlehem. Folks, isn't it good to know that God knew where the, where the Messiah was going to be born? And then I'm reminded that in Jeremiah 23 and verses 5 and 6, God promised that a king would come from the line of David to deliver the people of the world. Folks, listen, I'm telling you this morning, that deliverer came, that promise was kept, that Savior was born in a stable in Bethlehem. And thus the term Messiah becomes a customary designation of the Son of David, which was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now this morning, I want to lift four or five things out of the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 53, if you want to thumb your way there. I want to lift four or five things out of the book of, 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 of Isaiah that, that reveal to us the promised Messiah, Savior, that would come to be our Lord. Folks, I'm telling you this morning, there have been many wonderful promises on this earth made. There have even been many wonderful promises from heaven given, but none greater than the fact that God said, one day, one day, one day, I'm going to send you a deliverer. I'm going to send you a child that's going to be born in Bethlehem. Well, he's going to come from the lineage of David. He's going to be the Savior and Lord and King of the world. And so this morning, I want you to note with me the truth of God's assurance of the promise. The truth 
of God's assurance. Now, in Exodus chapter number 6 and verse number 6, the Bible says this, I will, refu- refu- I, will re- I will rescue you from your bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And in Exodus chapter 6, the, the visual is given of God caring for His people and rescuing us with an outstretched arm. And then the Bible says in Exodus 15, hold on to this thought, in Exodus 15, in verse 16, he says about victory over the Philistines by the greatness of your arm, they will be still as stones. God repeatedly uses that phraseology and that image of an outstretched arm toward his people. (coughs) In Deuteronomy 15, in verse number 5, he tells his people, you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand, and guess what? An outstretched arm. Do you see the visual? Do you see the care? Do you see the love? God said, I will bring you out with an outstretched arm. You go over to 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse number 42. He says that the people will come from afar and hear about your great name, your strong hand, and guess what? Your outstretched arm. Folks, listen, do you see it? God has an arm stretched from heaven toward earth, toward us, toward his people. And then I could go on and on. Because that phrase, if you go to the Old Testament, is used over and over again of the assurance that God has His hand stretched toward us. When God sent His Son to be our Savior and Lord, you know what He was doing? He was stretching His arm toward heaven, or from heaven toward earth, and saying, here He is, here's that promise, here's that Savior, here's that Messiah, Here's that deliverer. Here he is. He's going to come. And they're going to call him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Over and over and over, the Bible gives us the wonderful assurance that God was going to send a Savior. I'm grateful that he did. And so there was the promise, the assurance of God's Deliver with an outstretched arm toward earth, with a love beyond all love. God sent His Son to be our Savior. But then you go over to Isaiah 53. If you'd flip on over a few chapters, you'll come to Isaiah chapter number 53. And once again, God is renewing His promise. To us, because the Bible says there in Isaiah 56 in verse number 4, it says, Surely, surely He has borne our grief and carried our sorrow. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you see it? God stretched his arm toward the earth. And he said, there's going to be a child that's going to be born. In Micah 5, 5, he said he's going to be born in Bethlehem. But then he goes further and he tells us about the testimony of God's description. The testimony of God's description. Isaiah 53 gives us a description of the promised one. He's no longer in Isaiah 53 a child, but he's an adult. And he's taking upon his shoulders the sins of the whole world. Isaiah is talking about Jesus. We all know that. And he says, 
He's going to come up like a tender plant. Say, preacher, what does that mean? Let me illustrate. Anita and I moved to where we live today several years ago. And when we moved there, someone years earlier had planted crepe myrtle trees everywhere. How many of you have ever had a crepe myrtle tree? How many of you have ever tried to get rid of a crepe myrtle tree? <laughs> so I got my chainsaw out. We didn't like those things. They were grown up over the high. It was, it was ugly. I got my chainsaw out, and I started sawing and hauling off wood. And I had those things cut down to the ground. I thought I got rid of them. I cut it down to the ground. I thought that trunk was gone. But you know what? The next spring, these little old shoots started coming out of the ground. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Those little old shoots, they were tender plants coming out of the ground. You know what? They were coming off the trunk as a tender plant. The Bible says that Jesus was described as a tender plant coming out of there. I'm telling you from age to age, generation to generation, the devil, the wicked one, had tried to stall and thwart God's plan for the earth. But you know what? He couldn't because greater is he that's within us than he that's within the earth world. And the Bible says one day, one day, one day, there's going to be a tender plant. He's going to come up as a shoot out of the ground. And so I want you to notice that he says he's going to be as a tender plant. But then he goes on. And he said there's going to be no form of comeliness in him. Now what does he mean there? That word comeliness means splendor and beauty. And the idea is outward beauty. Now was God saying that his only son is going to be physically unattractive? No, 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 no. That's not what he's saying. That's not what that text means. You know what he's saying? Literally, he's saying he's not going to come as a beauty contestant. He's going to come forth as a Savior. Folks, I'm telling you this morning, the beauty of God is seen through the Savior that he sent to redeem mankind from the earth. And then he said, he said he's going to be despised and rejected. Now again, Isaiah, hundreds of years, centuries before Jesus came, had a word from heaven, and God said to Isaiah, now here's what's going to happen with my son I'm going to sin. He's going to be the deliverer. He's the promised one. I've got my hand stretched toward the earth. I'm in control of it. Don't worry. Here's what he's going to look like. He's going to come as a child in Isaiah 9, and then when he comes, he's going to grow up. He's going to be a tender plant, but then he's going to grow up, and he says he'll be despised and rejected. You go over to John chapter number 1 and verse number 11, and here's what John 1, 11 says. I came into my own, and my own received me not. But to as many as received me, to them gave I power to become the sons of God. That's what Jesus said through the pen of John. Folks, I'm telling you this morning, he was despised and rejected by many. But for those who receive him, for those who trust Him, for those who, who, who put their faith in Him, I'm telling you this morning, He'll be your Savior and Lord. He'll be your keeper. He'll be your coming King. He's going to be your all in all, your lily of the valley, your bright and morning star. If you will put your faith in Jesus, He will be your King. But then He says, He has borne our griefs. What did Isaiah mean when he says he has borne our grief? He was writing from the position that it had already been done. And folks, in the heart of God, it was already done. That is, the word born gives the idea of connection. That's what it means, connection. He has connected our griefs. He has been our bridge over troubled water. And I'm telling you today, folks, Jesus will be your breach because 1 Peter 2 
and verse 24 says this, He bore our sins on His own body on the tree. Folks, I'm telling you at Calvary, Jesus bridged that gulf between a sinful man and a holy God. And the only way you can reach and be connected with a holy God is through His Son that came to breathe that bridge, that propitiation for your sins. But then it says this, We esteemed Him, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. What He's saying there is that the pain of God The pain of Jesus was our pain that he bore on his own shoulder. And one other thing he says there, he says he was wounded for our transgressions. Don't mention, don't miss this. He was wounded for our transgressions. And I'm reminded that when you come to the Old Testament or the New Testament, the Bible says that they beat him 39 times. Just before he was nailed to that cross, 39 times they beat him with that whip. That cat of nine tails wrapped around his body. His body was lacerated. His body was mutilated. Why? Because he loved us. Because he came to bridge that gap. 39 times he was wounded for our transgressions, for our sins, for our iniquity. Folks, we don't deserve it but God loves us. And the Bible says that God stretched His hands toward the earth and He sent His darling Son who grew to be a man and that He was wounded for our transgressions. And so the testimony of the description of the promised one is given in 53. But then we go back to Isaiah 9 and verse number 6 and we see the titles. Not only the testimony, but the titles. Well, what are they? Well, there are many wonderful titles in the Bible. By the way, you can't have the title if you don't first have the testimony. And the Bible says here in Isaiah 9, He will be called Wonderful Counselor. That is, he's going to be my personal counselor. He's going to be my wonderful counselor. I want to tell you, friend, there's no counselor. You may go to an earthly counselor. You may go to a pastor as your counselor. You may go many direct, but you'll never find a greater counselor than Jesus. And he will be called wonderful counselor. He's going to be called mighty God. You remember that strong, outstretched arm? You remember that phraseology that we walked through the Old Testament? Well, folks, I'm telling you, he's our, he's, our, he's our strong, mighty God. And His arm is stretched toward His people. His arm is outstretched to receive you today. His love is still toward His people. And then He says He's going to be our everlasting Father. That is, God was, God is, and God forever will be. Folks, there's no beginning and there's no end to God. He is our everlasting Father, and He's the only one that can be the prince of the peace of your heart. He's the only one that can bring peace to your soul. So we see the testimony of God's description. We see the titles of God's promise. But then, finally, I want you to note one last thing. And that is the purpose for God's promised one. The purpose. And why did God send His Son to the earth? The Bible says in 1 John 5.13, 1 John 5.13, here it is, the purpose. These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. The very purpose of God was to give eternal life, to bridge the gulf between a sinful man and a holy God and give fellowship with the Father to you and me. Folks, I'm grateful for that fellowship. He came to die for the sins of man. It was 1903. The Wright brothers 
was trying to be the first to win the aviation fight, and be the first to fly an airplane. 1900, boy, we've come a long time since way from 1900. You can get on a plane and go to Europe in just a matter of hours. And if it weren't for the sound barrier and they ever, ever conquer it, you can do it in an hour. Technology's there, do it in an hour. Boy, I tell you, you ever been on a plane like that? Gone. 1903, the Wright brothers were trying to fly that first airplane, and finally they were successful up there at Kitty Hall. They got that plane up, and it flew for 120 feet. And they ran to a telegraph machine. Boy, that communication has come a long way since then too, hasn't it? And then they decided, we're going to send our sister Catherine, Catherine a telegram. Here's what it says. Flew for first time, 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. Catherine got that telegram. She ran to the editor of the local paper. She gave that telegram to the editor of the local paper. Flew for the first time. 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. To which the editor said, Isn't that nice? Those boys are coming home for Christmas. She looked at him. She said, you missed the message. They flew for the first time. No one had ever solved that problem. No one had ever flown an aircraft. It went 120. You missed the whole message of the telegram. I'm so afraid today that too many Missed the message of Christmas. In the midst of Christmas trees and decorations, in the midst of gifts and presents put under the tree, folks, we miss the message. The Bible says God stretched His hand toward the earth, His arm toward the earth. And the Bible says unto you a child is born. He's going to be born in, in Bethlehem. And he's going to grow up as a tender plant out of the ground. He's going to be wounded for our transgressions. Folks, we miss it. We miss it. We miss the message. Jesus came to die for the sins of the world. And I'm grateful that I was included in that whosoever. This morning you're here today and you do not know him as your personal Savior, this can be that glad hour. If you'll step out, <clears throat> I'll lead you here at the altar. I'll lead you in a sinner's prayer. and You can meet Him today, and He can be your Savior and Lord and the Prince of Peace in your life. If you are saved, I invite you to come and pray. Maybe bring that burden. Maybe bring that, that, that all adoration to God. Maybe you need to come and just talk to the Lord this morning. I don't know what God's saying to you. But as we give this hymn of invitation, would you come to Jesus? He's the promised one. He's the Messiah that came to die for the sins of man. Brother Allen, the music team are coming to lead us. <clears throat> I'll be here to meet you and to greet you.